I want to talk about some conceptual issues around researching research ethics committees, which may help us think about some of the things we're interested in. Um, so this, this comes out of my, my, my ethnographic and historical work on, on NHS research ethics in the UK. Um, I want, I have a, a sort of a, a quick response to Ron. I think we have to be careful. Ron said, with regard to ethics review, there's no way it's going to disappear. I think we have to be careful about that. If we think about the US, for example, where there are big changes possibly underway around IRB review of social science research. So in some form or another, it may well happen that IRB review of social science research will disappear in the US. Similarly, the debate we're having now is pretty Anglo-American. Ethics review by committees of social science is uncommon elsewhere in continental Europe. Now, we may have successfully exported ethics review of social science elsewhere in the, in, in, in the world, but we need to be aware that, that it, it's, it's a particular moment, it's a particular historical, it's a particular cultural, it's a particular geographical moment. And to some extent, one of the reasons I pick this up of, of, Ron, of, of Ron's work is, is, is that's one of the points I'm trying to raise. So what I want to talk about now is, is kind of four statements which come out of that I've, I've been sort of thinking about wrestling with that come out of, of, of my, my research um, which may be more or less contentious um, and we can, we can have a, a conversation about that but I think are things we need to think seriously about if we're going to A, research research ethics committees in an interesting and productive way and B, um, actually think about how to reform. So the first point is a historical one. Um, and this comes out of, out of work I've done thinking about why UK research ethics committees have changed the way they have. So if you look at the history from the late 60s through to, 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 to the current day, they've changed a lot. There have been a lot of developments in, in the UK research ethics committee system. So the obvious question is why? Why has it changed? Why have they been developed? Now, the typical answer from the literature is that changes in research ethics committee are driven by research scandals. Something goes wrong, there's a revision, there are changes to the system to tighten up, and then further down the line something else goes wrong. Okay, this is a, a, this is the, like the dominant explanation. In the case, so if this was the case, we'd expect two things. So the one is that major changes should be preceded by and large by a research scandal or something going wrong or a mistake. And the second one is obviously research scandals should be followed by major changes. I mean, I can cut to the chest and give you the answer to the slide, which is no. <laughs> there is pretty much no example that I can find where major changes, whether you're arranging for the actual development, why were Rex set up in 1967? Well, they're set up so British researchers could remain eligible for US funding. The Redbrook Guidelines in 1991, where the Department of Health actually took responsibility for research ethics committees for the first time, not set up because there had been a research scandal. They set up partly because um, the BMA had been sniffing around research ethics committees and had been pressurising for a centralised research ethics committee. Now, the Department of Health and the, the, the Royal College of Physicians and the MRC successfully suppressed the BMA's efforts to produce a centralised research ethics committee but realised that, that some sort of standardisation was inevitable. Uh, there were also changes in clinical ethics around informed consent and formalisation of informed consent and written informed consent, and the Department of Health took this as a sort of opportunistic chance to impose their will to some extent 
on medical professions and research as well. <coughs> but there was no scandal. Similarly, there was no scandal around the origin of research ethics committees at the multi center, EMREX, in 1997. Okay. So, scandals, so, or changes, are not preceded by scandals. And in fact, nor are scandals followed by changes. The death of Philip Jones, a Cardiff University medical student in 1984. There was a full review. The Royal College of Physicians produced a, a, a lengthy report on volunteers and research, the main key recommendation of which was that healthy volunteer research required external review, scientific review, outside of the pharmaceutical companies by the Ministry of Health. This was explicitly rejected. There were some other changes which were around insurance cover for healthy volunteers. But the major change, the one thing that would have actually changed the regulatory landscape as a result of Philip Jones' death was explicitly set aside by policy In 1999, this is the North Staffordshire Hospital NHS Trust, so that's the CNET trial. Um, while one, it coincided with things like the development of the, the, uh, the GAFREC and the Research Governance Framework in, uh, in the health, in fact, those changes were coming down the line anyway. So, I think we need to think a bit about why do we have RECs and why have they changed. They haven't, developments in the REC system in the NHS have not been around avoiding research scandal. They have actually largely been in the interests of researchers. I want to laugh right here. Similarly, the evolution of University Research Ethics Committees in the UK, as promoted by the ESRC in 2005, wasn't a research, result of research scandal. It was a result of sort of tensions between social scientists in, the, uh, in government and the Department of Health, and was an attempt to exclude, again, hollow laugh, social scientists from ethics review imposed by the Department of Health. It was actually done in the interest of social science research, not done because of any particular scam. Okay. The second claim I want to make concerns how we write about research evidence, specifically on a, on a sort of banal level, which examples we cite. So, my favourite example here, simply because he does it so clearly, is, is Zach Schrag, who is a, uh, a, an American um, historian who has written a, a very good book about the, the origin and development of ethics review of social science in the US. But he also has a, a, a stream of work where he writes about current problems in ethics review. And in many ways, that, Zach and Schrag's work is a prime example, although not the only one, there are plenty of other people, right? Where authors write to criticize <coughs> ethics review. And in order to criticize ethics review, you want examples. So you, you pull examples. You pull examples from the US, and you pull an example from the UK, something from Australia. The trouble is, of course, you're not comparing like with like. Ethics review in all these systems is very different. So, to take the results of ethics review, the, the issues that, say, uh, American social scientists find in the US around IRVs, specific problems that specific researchers have found, and say, therefore, ethics review of social scientists in the UK is flawed, is extremely problematic. So the, the kind of model here is that the idea that IRBs are the same as REBs in Canada, the same as RECs in, in the UK, NHS or universities, the same as HRECs in Australia. The idea you're, and this is an odd thing for social scientists to do, medics do it as well. So this is a characteristic of complaints about research ethics review across the board. But I think it's particularly true in social science literature. And it's particularly it's more disappointing on the part of social scientists. So this sort of erosion of difference, 
this assumption that regardless of institutional context or history or culture or background, that an IRB, the problems that an IRB raises for a social scientist, must therefore be the same as the problems that an HREC raises in Australia. And, you know, the comparison I want to make is, well, look, this is like thinking about universities. This is like saying that community colleges, two-year community colleges in the U.S., are the same as Ivy League universities in the U.S., are the same as, for example, state universities. And that the problems faced by one or the deficiencies of community colleges are the same as the deficiencies of state universities or Ivy League universities. <coughs> if a social scientist started making those sorts of claims, I think people would very quickly say, well, actually, you can't. You're comparing very, very different things. You're comparing institutions that have almost nothing in common. Yes, they're all education. They're all higher education institutions. But to say that the problems of a two-year community college are the same as the problems of an Ivy League, by virtue of the fact that they're, they're the, they look similar, is a mistake. You have to prove that the problems are the same. Maybe there are consistent problems across all these systems. But that's something you have to prove rather than something you have to assume. It's the end point of research, not the starting point. Okay. So my third statement, and this is my ideas here are perhaps a little fuzzy. I'm still trying to wrestle, I'm still trying to think about ways to articulate this. But the, the issues here is around what we think about harm and success around ethics review. Okay, so look, when ethics review goes wrong, sometimes we know it's gone wrong. So this is Ryan Wilson, who was one of 60 healthy volunteers involved in the TGM 1412 trial in uh, spring 2006. Um, this was the, the super monoclonal antibody that went quite disastrously wrong. Um, the the, the six hundred is very ill. There's Ron Wilson, there's Ron Wilson's fingers, which he's had to have amputated because it's a form of um, uh, the gangrene. He's had all his toes taken off. There are possible long-term health issues for these six young men. Now look, that's now we can. I've written about whether actually what went wrong was the ethics of you going wrong, but something went wrong there. Okay, that's harm, and that's quite clear. And we can have a conversation about should the ethics committee have done something different. The trouble is, those kinds of events are very rare in biomedical research. But there is a, a, a strain of thought, so this is, this is Ian Chalmers of the, the Cochrane Centre, uh, and Ian has written quite a lot, and Ian is a former member of the Research Ethics Committee, and he argues that actually Research Ethics Review kills people. Not by making, not by mistakes like the TGA Bondo trial, but by um, delaying research. Or, for example, by allowing research to take place where it, a decent literature review would have shown that actually it's simply repeating stuff that we already know. So this is, this is quite a, and, and other people, people like uh, Ben Goldacre have, have, have echoed this, this sort of thing. So this is a, a sort of argument that's there in the, um, the, the evidence-based medicine community. And it's, and there's lots, you know, they can come up with lots of evidence, lots of numbers. And this is where we start running into the problems with thinking about the harms. Because if a clinical trial goes through an ethics review and nothing goes wrong, does that mean the ethics review worked? Is nothing going wrong? Is that a result of the ethics reviews? Now, if you wanted to defend ethics, you would say, yes, look, ethics reviews working. We've actually got very low rates of harm from clinical trials. Or we might say, we might broaden it, we might say the <coughs> regulatory system as a whole. I, I'm uncomfortable with that. I'm not sure we can necessarily make that claim, because there's lots of things ethics reviews, changes the ethics review make to protocols or the form of consent documents. 
which may make no difference. The thing is, if ethics review works, then, then there should be no harms. But you don't know if there are no harms because the ethics review is working or because actually there's a wide range of possible outcomes. So this is an obvious example where we can say, OK, Rep 1 is doing a better job than Rep 2. Here's a project of using a, a well-known drug resulting in serious known side effects. Um, and Rep 1 rejects this, this study. It's a multi-center study. Rejects the study on the grounds that the drug is dangerous and that a case hasn't been made. Whereas Rep 2 approves it on the same grounds. Now, we can have a debate over risk and benefit, but if we posit that the drug is so dangerous that there is very, very little possible benefit, we can reasonably comfortably say Rep 1 has done a better job than Rep 2. But that is very, very rare. This is much more common. You've got a novel drug, you've got two research ethics committees, one of them makes some changes to the protocol of information sheet, there's no bad result. It's a second committee, makes some different changes to the protocol. We can think about this as, as happening in different countries, for example, different jurisdictions. Could be a European-wide drug. <coughs> okay, which, is, which one's done a better job? We can't even say they've necessarily done the same job. We don't know. It's a very difficult question to answer. So, part of the problem, I'm going to skip that one, I'm going to let, part of the problem around thinking about harm, the harm that research ethics committees can cause and the harms that they protect us from, is that if they're doing their job properly, there won't be any harm, but you don't know if there's no harm, whether that's because they've done their job properly or whether it's just one of those things. Turning the handle one more time, there are lots of harms that aren't like Ryan Wilson getting his fingers on top. There are what, lots of what we might call intangible harms or, or, or dignitary harms. What harms do we cause people if we carry out essentially safe risk-free research, but we don't ask their informed consent. Do we cause them harm? So there is a, one way of thinking is, yes, we are. We're causing them what we might call intangible harms or harms to their dignity. I'm a fan of that term. <clears throat> Do we harm people by carrying out research without their informed consent? <laughs> and after all, a lot of what Rex do is around assuring informed consent. So, the, the original title of my paper, which I sort of skipped, is, you know, we don't, this sort of comes from, from Robert Dingwall's attack on research ethics review of social sciences. We don't, we don't inject people with green stuff. We don't, by and large, as social scientists, engage in serious physical intervention. So the harms that participants in our research run are very different from the harms that research ethics review is set up to protect. And of course, at a certain level, Robert Jane was right. But we need a broader discussion of the kinds of harms that can take place in research, which actually are intangible and are very hard to detect. I said this section was a bit kind of fuzzy. I, I, I don't know what the answer is here. But I do know when we think about the harms resulting from ethics review, because that is to some extent what this conference is about, we need to think about some of the harms that ethics review protects research participants from. Okay, so the, the, the final point, and this, this links to some of what Ron was talking about. And, and the, the, my broader point about, about pseudo-isomorphic thinking in discussions around research ethics review. That if we're going to think about the way in which a specific committee thinks about harms, thinks about risk, we need to think about its institutional context. So in the UK, for example, we've got two different kinds of research ethics committee. 
We've got the NHS Research Ethics Committees, which have been around since late 60s, early 70s, and are uh, organized and overseen by a particular part of the Department of Health, which comes up with loads of centralized guidelines. And then we have the University Research Ethics Committees, which have been sort of formalized by the ESRC document, the Research Evaluation Framework, uh, in 2005. Although actually, we have to acknowledge that there were a lot of university level reps, usually in psychology departments, around before then. So it's quite clear that in many ways the ESRC did not, that the University Research Ethics Committees in the UK did not start with the ESRC document at all, but that, that it sort of formalised and, and standardised some of this thinking. Um, and then of course if we're thinking about the US, we've got, we've got IRBs. And actually I think my argument would be that university recs in the UK look more like IRBs than they look like NHS recs. NHS recs are very deinstitutional, formally at least. They started out in the late 60s as committees of individual hospitals. Over time, they've gradually answered out, they've been broadened, they've been answerable to district health authorities, strategic health authorities. Uh, they now answer directly to the Department of Health. Um, their remit has changed from research done at a specific institution to research done anywhere in the UK. So the vast majority of NHS recs now can approve a single study that's going to be conducted at any number of sites in the UK, whether it's going to be conducted at, at the sort of location where that rec is based or not. So I can get approval from a rec in Cardiff to do research in the other end of the country. This deinstitutionalization has got to the stage where, for example, the past few years, these committees which for historical reasons, have kept the names of the hospitals at which they started out, have been explicitly told to change their names. So there is no more University College Hospital. Ah, uh, well, I see. University College Hospital always had two recs, and they could never agree, and they couldn't have a hospital, they couldn't have University College Hospital rep one and two, or A and B, because that would imply <coughs> superiority. So they had UCH Hospital A and Alpha. I kid you not. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, this is the separate story. So many people told me that story. That's great. Anyway, so anyway, they've, they've changed their London Central and London East or whatever. So all, all the, the, the location, all the, the institutional links have been broken. Now, that doesn't mean informally that institutional links don't happen. But formally, NHS recs are not institutional. Well, they're of the institution of the NHS, but they're not a specific hospital. Very different to university recs, very different to and this picks up on, 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 on Ron's point about IRBs operating in the interest of the host institution rather than thinking about research ethics. So this is something I've, I've, I've published recently on. And of course, in the US, this is entirely uncontroversial. This is Jonathan Moss. Jonathan Moss was chair of one of the RECs, one of the IRBs, at the time, IRBs at the University of Chicago for decades. Jonathan Moss said this, this isn't controversial. <coughs> the role of institutional review boards be, can be to forestall the public image problems and protect the institution's reputation by weeding out politically sensitive studies. And this is now a characteristic of rep practice in universities in the UK. Because the original decision from the ESRC, for fairly good resource allocation reasons, was to base the research ethics committees, was to model itself on the IRB system in the US. That's explicit. So it's unsurprising <coughs> that researchers in universities in the UK are experiencing similar problems around institutional reputational protection that researchers in the US have experienced for decades. So this is, this is from 
the experience of Ron Roberts, who's a psychologist at Kingston University, who does work on um, sex workers at university. So university students um, turn into sex work because of student debt. Um, and he's experienced considerable problems in being able to research the students at Kingston University. <coughs> so the rep at Kingston University is happy for him, happy, <laughs> is uh, okay with him researching students from other universities <laughs> who might be turning to sex work, but they won't let him research students at Kingston University. And this is, a, this is an email, and this is sort of underpinning some of the issues. This is published in press office. This was a survey that he did of students' second-hand experience. He wasn't even asking students at Kingston if they had, but if they knew someone who had been involved in sex work while at university. And this generated, this research generated uh, a response from the press office that please don't scare the horses. It's affecting our market share. <laughs> so he was allowed to quote from this? Sorry? He was allowed to quote from this? Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, second result. So, that's, so that's, that's, that's kind of sex. So that's, look, we're, we're British, okay? We have an issue with sex. We're always, it's always going to be a problem with us. It's always going to be politically sensitive. You know, blame the Victorians. The other problem, the other modern problem is terrorism. Sex and terrorism. The two things that university research ethics committees can't deal with. This is the, the other example I've written a bit about. This is Rob Thornton, who was a, a, a lecturer at Nottingham University, who spoke up in support of a couple of students who had been accused of getting hold of um, the Al-Qaeda terrorist handbook. Um, actually, they, they, he got it from the university library. <laughs> <laughs> but they were arrested, and there was an investigation. And what happened was Rob Thornton's teaching was subject to research ethics committee review as a way of, of clearing it to make sure that not everyone has, this is the head of the, the department concerned so the idea that the research ethics committee was, attention was turned away from research review human subjects protection to use the American phrase and actually reviewing access to documents available in the library or off the US Department of Justice website. So my argument would be that these sorts of problems, these, these, are, these are problems resulting from the institutional organization of research ethics committees. These are not problems that are inherent in research ethics committees. How we organize research ethics committees, the institutional context in which we place them generates concerns around specific harms. And if you place an ethics committee in a specific, tight institutional context, then it will generate concerns about harms to that institution which are not about research ethics. Thank you very much.